Bia, and welcome back to Cardiac Radio for Teens. For those of you who might not be familiar with Cardiac Radio for Teens, Cardiac Radio for Teens is a place where teens can come together with other teens to learn more about Spiritist teachings and topics in a way that sometimes we really don't get from just listening to adults or from lectures or in books. So hopefully we can make it more understandable and right now we've been going through a phase where we've been reading through the Spirits book together. And we go piece by piece, word by word, trying to really fully understand it as much as we can right now so that we can open up our mind about the basics of Spiritism. We are on question 222. And this question, it was kind of weird because it wasn't actually a question. It was just kind of the Spirits going on and explaining a whole bunch of information and kind of summary, summarizing what we were talking about. So they kind of just put it as a question number, but it's not really a question. They just kind of put paragraphs explaining stuff and it goes on for a, a lot of pages. So we have been going through this for a couple of weeks now. And so we'll just continue today this has and been maybe we'll great for finish teams. it. Maybe Thank you all for will. listening. And we'll just and go from there. But either way, no matter how long a question is or how short it is, it is important to go through everything in that. So we left off last week talking about some issues that some people might seem unfair and don't understand why it happens, like children who die really, really young. So why do these things make sense is what we were talking about. So then they continue. Is there any doctrine that can solve these issues? However, except the existence of successive lies and everything can be explained in conformity with God's justice. What we are unable to accomplish in one existence, we will in another. Thus, no one escapes the law of progress. All will be rewarded according to their true individual merit, and none will be excluded from the supreme bliss as to which they aspire, no matter what obstacles they may have encountered along the way. So what they're trying to say here is that just looking at one existence, it might not make a lot of sense, but if we look into the plurality of existences, which is what we were talking about in this chapter, when we see and we look beyond just this life, it can make a lot more sense to us and see how it fits in with, with what God wants. So then they continue. Such issues m could be multiplied to infinity because the psychological and moral problems that have no solution other than the plurality of existences are innumerable. We, are, we have restricted ourselves only to the most general. Nevertheless, it may still be argued that the doctrine of reincarnation has not been accepted by the church. It would therefore be subversion of Christianity. It is not our subject at the moment to address this issue, since it is sufficient for us to have shown that the doctrine is eminently inem moral and rational. Furthermore, what is moral and rational cannot be contrary to a religion that proclaims, proclaims God as goodness and reason par excellence. What would become of Christianity if, contrary to universal opinion and testimony of science, it had denied the evidence and expelled whomever did not believe in the moment, in the moment of the sun and the six days of creation? What credit would a religion deserve, and what authority would it have among enlightened nations if it were based on such obvious errors that were once articles of faith? Whenever evidence has been established, the church has wise, wisely sided with it. If it is proven that things exist which, should, which would be impossible without reincarnation, if certain point if certain points of church dogma cannot be explained except by such means, then it will be necessary to accept it and realize that the antagonism between this doctrine and the church dogma is only apparent. So here what they're saying is they're talking about, so how can, how can we accept this reincarnation if the church, like the Catholic church and, other, and Christian beliefs, if they don't think this? How can we accept it? And they say that we can't, we have proof. They don't want to talk too much about it, but they have proven that spiritism, it's moral and it's rational. So we're not trying to go against any other religion. And then it continues. Later, 
we will show that perhaps the church is less removed from this doctrine than it is that than it thinks and that it would suffer no more in accepting it than in suffering from the discovery of the moment of the earth around the sun and the ecological periods which at first also seem to contradict the sacred text moreover the principle of reincarnation appears in many scripture passages and is found especially and implicitly for explicitly formulated in the gospels so basically what they're trying to say is that it wouldn't be that terrible just like how other things have come up that have kind of gone against what the church was saying but they got over it and they kind of fixed it and they worked in between it so it wouldn't really be the end of the world but they said that that's and then what we're getting into now is that they're going to show us some examples straight from the Gospels of where reincarnation appeared. So the first one says, Descending from the mountain after the transfiguration, Jesus commanded them, saying, Do not tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from, has been raised from among the dead. His disciples then questioned him. Then why do, you, why do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? And Jesus responded, In truth, Elijah is to come first and will reestablish all things. But I declare to you that Elijah has already come, and they do not know him, but made him suffer everything they wish. If it thus that they will put it is thus that they will put to death the Son of Man. Then do the disciples understood that he had spoken to them of John the Baptist. So here, although subtle, what they're showing is that stuff that's in the Bible that even at the at churches read, it's showing hints of reincarnation, but it's not obvious. It doesn't say reincarnation, so many people overlook it, but that's an example of where it is and then it goes to a better explanation and it says if john the baptist was elijah he must have therefore been re the reincarnation of the spirit or soul of elijah in the body of john the baptist so right there you just have to put a little thinking into it and then you'll see that oh, okay he's talking about reincarnation that this guy is now this guy so it's showing reincarnation subtly but many people just overlook that and they don't label it as reincarnation but really it is there whatever may be the opinion that persons have about reincarnation whether they accept or reject it no one will escape it by merely believing in, to the contrary the essential point is that the teaching of the spirits is an eminently christian it rests upon the immor immorality of the soul future punishment and reward, God's justice, human free will, and the moral of Christ. It is therefore not anti-Christ, anti-Christian. So what they're saying here is that we're not going against anything Christian. We're still believing in Jesus and all that he taught us. So it is to Christian. It's not, some people may say that reincarnation is anti-Christian, which is against Christ and against like, Jesus's beliefs and people who believe in Jesus but they're saying that while when we're looking at all of these these factors of spiritism they really go with Christian Christianity too so it's not anti-Christ we anti-Christian we are Christians as well and then it continues as stated previously our reasoning up to this point has excluded all spiritist teachings which, cer which certain individuals regard as being without authority. If we, as so many others, have adopted the doctrine of the plurality of existences, it is not only because it has come from the spirits, but because it seems to us to be the most logical and the only one that resolves issues that until now have been irresolvable. So what they're saying is that until now, we weren't talking specifically about spiritist teachings. We were just pulling together facts from different places. And they're saying that, but up until now, this, we are adopting this because 
one, because the spirits told us, but two, because this makes sense. Questions and things that we thought didn't have an answer now have an answer. So it's making sense to us and it's becoming more logical. So that's why they're accepting this. Then they continue. If it had come to us from a mere mortal, we would have we would have adopted it just the same, not hesitating to give up our own former ideas. The moment an error is exposed, our self-esteem has more to lose than to gain in sustaining it. In the same way, we would have in the same way we would have rejected reincarnation even though it had come from the spirits if it had seemed to us to be contrary to reason, just as we have rejected so many other doctrines. We know by experience that we must not bindedly accept everything that comes from spirits in the same way that we cannot accept everything that comes from human beings. So what they're saying is that even if, because they're saying one of the reasons, okay, it came from the spirits, but if it was a human that brought this idea, and if it made sense, then we would still accept it. And also, if it was, if the spirits brought this idea, but it didn't make any sense to us, then we wouldn't accept it. So it's not just because of this, it's because it makes logical sense. And then, so then they continue. To our minds, it first mer the first merit is, the, is that it is eminently logical, but it also has another merit in its favor, confirmed by the facts, positive facts, material ones, so to speak, which an attentive and well-reasoned study may reveal to whoever strives to observe them with patience and perseverance, and before which doubt is no longer possible. Once these facts become widely known, then it is then like the formation and the movement of the earth, it will be necessary to yield to the evidence, and its opponents will have to waste opposing arguments in vain. So if people really want to find out if this is true, if they're skeptical, then they can go and research because that's what we're saying. It makes logical sense. There's proof. There's facts. So people can go and find it. And they said just like how back in the day, people thought that the earth was flat, that it was like a square, just a 2D square. But then when they when people were discovering okay no it's not just a square it's not flat and then so they're the first people who thought of that they were seen as crazy but and then after putting in facts and searches and studies then they realized okay yeah you're right and whoever wanted to argue could argue but it wasn't going to change the fact that those people were right that it was not flat so that's kind of the same thing people might want to change their arg continue arguing arguing, but the facts are there, and that's it. In sum, we recognize the fact that the doctrine of the plurality of existences is the only one that can explain what would be unexplainable without it, that it is eminently consoling and conforms to the strict strictest justices. For humankind, it is the life preserver that God, out of divine mercy, has thrown to them. So here they're just summing it up. So this, the plurality of existences and reincarnation, this makes sense to us because it explains stuff that we weren't able to explain before. Questions that we didn't understand, like why children died so young and why some people had such harsh, harsh lives and where the God's justice fit into all of this. So questions that we couldn't answer, we can now answer. The words of Jesus himself can, lead no, can leave no doubt about this. As we read the third chapter of John's Gospel, verse 3, In reply to Nicodemus, Jesus stated, Truly, truly, I say to you, that if a man is not born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So right there, it was clearly saying that if he's not born again, if he doesn't reincarnate, if he doesn't learn some more, then he won't reach the kingdom of God. Verse 4, Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter again into his mother's womb and be born a second time? Verse 5, Jesus responded, Truly, truly, 
I tell you that unless he is born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I have told you, you must be born again. So right there, Jesus clearly was stating that you must be born again. You're not just going to be able to magically reach the kingdom of God without going through more trials and learning more than just this one life. So now we have finally reached the end of question 222. So we're going to move on to the next chapter, chapter 6, which is about spirit life. And the first section of this chapter is called errant spirit. And the errant, they put a little footnote, errant means disincarnated. So that are not in this, like on earth right now with us, incarnated in human bodies. They're disincarnated. They're in the spirit world. So question 223. Does the soul re reincarnate immediately after separation from the body? So the question is, right after we die and your soul separates from the body you're in right now, does it imme immediately go to someone else and be born again that quick? And the spirits answered, sometimes it it's reincarnation, it reincarnates immediately, but more often after an interval of longer or shorter duration. On more, on more highly evolved worlds, reincarnation is almost always immediate. Since the corporeal matter of those worlds is less coarse, an incarnated spirit enjoys nearly all of his spirit faculties. Its normal state is the same as that of your lucid synobolist. So here they're saying that sometimes it is immediate, but most time, especially for us that are on le on uh, levels such as like Earth, then it does take. We do have an interval where we're in between. We're not. We have to wait in the spirit world a little bit and figure some stuff out, especially because our we're very material and our bodies are so dense that it's a lot harder to just immediately reincarnate. But it can happen. And in the higher evolved world, they have less of this dense material that we have, so it's easier for them to just immediately evolve, uh, reincarnate. Question 224. What becomes of the soul during the interval between incarnations? So for those who don't immediately reincarnate, what happens in that interval, in that space of time? And the spirits answer, it becomes an errant spirit aspiring to and waiting a new destiny so before like before we said an errant spirit means disincarnated so it's not incarnated it's a disincarnated spirit and they're waiting for their next thing that they have to overcome their next mission their next life their next trials and then there's a sub question to this and it says how long may such intervals last so how long are they in this in-between state and the spirits answered, from a few hours to thousands of centuries. Strictly speaking, there is no outside limit assigned to the errant state. It may last for a very long time, but never forever. Sooner or later, a spirit will have the opportunity to begin another existence, which serves for the purification of its previous ones. So, like they, so here they said, it can be a few hours, it can be two hours, three hours, or it can be thousands of centuries. But even though to us thousands of centuries is a long time, that's still not forever. When you have infinite, when you have infinity in front of you, forever is a lot more than a thousands thousands of centuries. So you might there's no limit of how long you're gonna be there. It's just depending on what's best for you, and and to, but sooner or later, like they said, you're gonna have to go back and try again and fix the mistakes from your past life so you're never going to be stuck in that forever and then there's another question does the length of the interval depend on the spirit's own will or can it be imposed as an expiation so is it the spirit who decides when they're going to be able to go back and how long they're going to stay there or is it kind of another trial for them and the spirits answered it is a consequence of its free will. Spirits know full well 
what they are doing in prolonging it. But for some, extending it is also a punishment inflicted by God. Others ask for it to be extended in order to pursue studies that cannot be done productively except in the spirit state. So what happens is, like they were saying, it's free will, basically, of how long you're really going to stay there. So some spirits, they know that they're, they just want to push it out. They, I don't want to go back. I don't want to make up for all those mistakes I did yet. So they kind of push it back, but it's their free will that's pushing them back. But sometimes, but sometimes they do have to have an extended period because of something they did wrong, or maybe they took something for granted. So that could be part of their trial, but mostly it's up to free will. And sometimes it's just to learn more. That something that they can't learn in, let's say, Earth. So they'll just stay over in the spirit world a little bit longer to, to be able to learn more before coming back and reincarnated on Earth or on any other planet. Question 225. Is the errant state in and of itself an indication of spirits who are less evolved? So is this disincarnated state when you're in the middle of being reincarnated and you just you just died and you're waiting to be to go back again so is this are these only less evolved spirits and the spirits answered no since there are errant spirits of every degree incarnation is the state that is transitory as we are al- as we have already stated in their normal state Spirits are disengaged from matter. So, so no, there's spirits on all levels because even if you're very high, highly evolved, but I, but not perfect yet, but if you're very highly evolved, you're still might gonna have to come back for something, maybe a mission or just to tweak up a little thing that you have wrong before you're actually perfect. So you're still gonna have to reincarnate again. So you're still in that state. In that state. Question 226. Could we say that all spirits who are not incarnated are errant? And the spirits answered, Those who must reincarnate, yes, but the pure spirits who have reached perfection are not errant. Their state is definitive. So all 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 the spirits who still have something to approve who aren't at that top level yet, they are in this errant state, in this disincarnate. They still can, they still have to go back. They still are gonna do something more before they're just perfect. But the pure spirits, the perfect spirits, their state is definite. They're gonna be there. They don't have to go back. Like Jesus, he came back. He incarnated to help us, but that wasn't something that he had to do. And so that's the main difference. And then Alan Kardec puts his own comment, and he says. Regarding their innermost qualities, spirits belong to different orders or degrees through which they pass successively as they purify themselves. Regarding their state as spirits, they may be incarnate, that is, connected to a body. Errant, that is, disconnected from the material body while awaiting a new incarnation in order to improve themselves. Or pure, that is, perfect and having no further need of incarnation. So here he split it up into three sections. So they could be incarnate spirits. So they're connected to a body like us being on earth. Or they could be errant where they're disconnected from a body and they're waiting for their next reincarnation, their next trials and expiations. Or they could be pure so they don't have anything further to improve so they don't have to to incarnate anymore. And we'll leave off for there today, but before we leave off today, I'd like to read our Daily Book of Positive Quotations for today's date, May 2nd. Loving Yourselves You yourself, as much as anybody in the entire universe, deserves your love and affection. Buddha No one is harder on us than we are on ourselves. We see our own physical flaws when we look in the mirror. We remember our, only our mistakes when we look back on the day we've just spent. We sometimes beat ourselves up even when we've done nothing wrong. And yet, others like us. Some even love us. What do they see in us that we don't? It's good to be honest with ourselves, but we should be kind. 
We can give more love and affection to others if we start with love and affection for ourselves. I am a good person, trying to do the best I can. I will remember this and be as nice to myself as I try to be to others. I'm Bia. Thank you all for listening. This has been Cardiac Radio for Teens. Thank you all for listening.